This week is a very special week because it follows on the heels of Shavuos, Shavuot, the festival of the giving of the Torah. Whenever you have a festival, the week that follows that festival, and especially the Shabbos that follows, it's not considered to be a new period. We've got finished, we finished the holiday, that's over, that's already canned, and now we start on a new venture, preparing for the next holiday. Well, that's true, we're always preparing for the next. It doesn't mean that we already left Mount Sinai. We're still in the vicinity of Mount Sinai. And when Shabbos comes, not only are we in the vicinity of Mount Sinai, but whatever happened on the holiday of Shavuos, the Shabbos afterwards, even though the Shavuos concluded on Shabbos, but still the Shabbos afterwards elevates all the preceding days of the week, which were blessed by the Shabbos of Shavuos. So we're having a very heavy week, and maybe that's one of the reasons it has been suggested as such that this week's Torah portion is the very longest Torah portion of all the 53 Torah portions. The Midrash and the Zohar on this section is also more than it is in any other parsha. So this is a very heavy parsha. One of the commandments is about theft. When a person commits a sin of theft, they have to make amends for it. They have to confess their sin. And there's a little bit of a grammatical anomaly here. When the Torah speaks about the sin itself, the Torah uses the singular. The Torah says if a person commits theft, a man or a woman that commits theft, and that person has to confess his sin. But it doesn't say that person has to. It says that they shall confess their sin rather than he or she should confess. So the question is, why does the Torah make this transition from singular, when it's talking about an individual, to plural, when it's still talking about an individual? That's one question. Another question is, there are many commandments in the Torah that tell us what we're not allowed to do, many sins, many transgressions. And if a person violates them, they have to do tshuva, they have to repent, they have to return. And tshuva involves confession. So why does the Torah single out the mitzvah of theft, the prohibition of theft, to talk about confession for the sin? What about if a person violates the Sabbath? What about if a person eats non-kosher? What about if a person commits any other crime? They also have to confess their sin in order for their tshuva, their repentance, to be intact. So why does the Torah mention the idea of confession specifically in the context of theft? And what is the connection to the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai? How does the mitzvah of theft, although it's one of the Ten Commandments, well, not exactly, according to the Talmud, the commandment that says do not commit theft. Lotignov doesn't mean theft of property, it means theft of a soul, kidnapping. Whereas the prohibition against theft of property is mentioned in Leviticus. But in spite of that, commentators point out that the pro prohibition against theft mentioned in the Ten Commandments contains within it, under its rubric, all forms of theft. At any rate, what is the connection of theft to the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, which was such a cataclysmic event? Why is theft, which is a specific prohibition, what it, how is it germane to the subject of the revelation at Mount Sinai? Well, let's first answer the first question, the anomaly. It starts off with a singular and concludes with the plural when it's talking about the crime of theft and the confession, it uses the plural. And the answer is, very simple answer, based on a principle that's based on the Torah, that the Talmud discusses, kol Yisrael arevim zeh lozeh, or zeh bezeh. All of Israel are responsible for one another. When a person does something wrong, it may be one individual who does it, but every Jew is responsible to help bring about the resolution of that transgression. The Arizo, the great Kabbalist, explains why is it on Yom Kippur when we say the confession, and the confession is repeated, every letter of the alphabet is represented twice. I know very few people who could say that they're guilty of all those crimes. And yet, everyone, the greatest rabbi, the simplest Jew, everyone in between will say the confession of all those sins for which most people have not committed. 
And the Arizal answers that when we say the confession, we're confessing not just our own sins, but everyone else's, because it's like one organic whole, we're one body. If one part of the body hurts, it affects and is caused by other parts of the body. And therefore, we have to do a communal confession, not just an individual confession. But still, why is this idea of communal confession, why is that relevant specifically, primarily, in the context of theft? And the answer, in a nutshell, is that every time we deviate from God's plan, we're actually guilty of theft. What is the definition of theft? If I take something that is intended for someone else and I say, I want to use it, that's theft. When God gave us resources, he gave us abilities, he gave us the wherewithal to fulfill all of the commandments, which is the mission he gave us at Mount Sinai. And God says, your mission is to take these commandments and implement them. And how could you implement them? I'm giving you the resources. I'm giving you the wisdom to learn about them. I'm giving you the wisdom to know how to practice them. I'm giving you the physical abilities to do them. And we're very grateful to God for all our physical abilities. But why did God give us a hand? The hand was given so we can give tzedakah. We could stretch out our hand and give to others. Why did he give us a brain so we could study Torah? Why does he give us legs so we can go to the shul, the synagogue, or the house of study, and so on and so forth? Every organ of our body was designed to enable us to fulfill our mission. When we take those resources, and God allows us to use it for other things as well. Yes, we could use our hands to do everything that we need to do in order to live and, and, and thrive even if it's not directly connected to a mitzvah, because ultimately everything that we do is for our health, for our well-being, and that translates into more energy and more ability to do the right things, the things that we were commissioned to do. But when we use our resources for a negative thing, for a transgression, that's theft. Because we took some resources that are not ours, that were given to us for a specific purpose. Someone entrusts you with something, gives you a car and says, I want you to go on this mission. You're employed by someone who lends you his car in order to fulfill the purpose for which you were hired. And you take the car and you drive to some other place on a vacation that you were not authorized to do. That's theft. Although he gave you the car and he gave you the ability to drive that car, permission to drive it, but it was reserved for the right things, for the things for which you were commissioned. The same thing is true when we take our God-given abilities, and we use it for something that it was not intended for, that is a form of theft. And that form of theft has to be corrected, not just by one person trying to rectify that which they did wrong. That one person has to do his or her part, but it's incumbent upon every one of us because this mission is a mission that affects everyone and everyone will benefit from fulfillment of this mission that will bring about the messianic age. And therefore, when someone commits the crime of theft, which means every transgression, it's not just physically the literate meaning of the word theft, but every transgression is theft, there's a need for confession. There's a need to recognize that what we did was wrong and has to be corrected. It's not enough to just say, I'm sorry, perfunctorily, a person has to recognize what they did wrong. Because if we don't recognize what we did wrong, we, we remained mired in the mentality of golos, of exile. Exile, golos, galut, whichever way you want to pronounce it, is a form of toxicity where the atmosphere is toxic. Every time we commit a transgression, we're generating negative, destructive fumes, and the fumes cause us to become tired and sleepy, so we're less aware of what our responsibilities are. So it's very hard for a person who has generated those toxic fumes to change. We need the support and the help of others, and together we get rid of that toxic fume of golos, and we introduce the pleasant fragrances of Mashiach. One of the things about Mashiach that's mentioned in the book of Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 11, is that Mashiach will have the power of smell. He will sense things, justice, with his power of smell. In other words, the coming of Mashiach is identified with fragrance. Instead of the toxic fumes that we can't breathe, 
suffocates us in Golos, we will have the beautiful fragrances of Mashiach that will bring the world to its fulfillment.